Blake McCoskey is a best-selling author, founder of Tom Shoes, and developer of the one-for-one -one business model, which helped provide over 86 million pairs of shoes to children since 2006. He went from competing in the CBS series The Amazing Race and coming within minutes of winning the $1 million grand prize to building a company worth hundreds of millions of dollars with no investors. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life, like nine. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Blake McCoskey and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, master the art of storytelling. The number one thing that I say that if you really plot like the growth of Tom's, 2006 is when I started. It's also the year that Facebook was went off campus. And social media in yeah, general. 2007 was the year that YouTube started. Wow. You know, so literally you can plot. So it's probably Twitter or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So you can literally plot our growth to the growth of social media. Wow. And so it's, and, 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 and I think that the reason that is so important is, and this is why other brands have emulated this both from a giving perspective but also from just a business perspective, is that it became about storytelling. And that's so much what you're about, you know, yeah. right? So it's like it's about like connecting people to a story, to the power to be part of something bigger than themselves. Wow. And you could never do that through advertising because it wouldn't be authentic. But what is authentic is when you got your first pair of Toms in 2007 and you watched a video of us giving them to children in Argentina, you wanted to post that on your Facebook, uh, that, and Facebook or MySpace, yeah. it was a big deal back then, and, and say like, look, I did this. I actually am wearing these shoes because it's helping these kids get shoes. Right. And so I think that's a big part of why we were able to grow. And then the other part of our growth that is really unique is I had no investors. And it went from zero to half a billion in sales with no investors in five years. Have a billion in sales in five years. Six years. Six, Six years, years. Yeah. wow. So so that- That's crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. But and these are like affordable shoes. Yeah, these aren't 40, like- Yeah, $48. These aren't $300 shoes. shoes. No, no. 40 to- It's a lot of much? shoes. 48 to, our boots sell for like 150 Yeah, yeah, yeah. but back then- Yeah, it's it all was 40 bucks. 40 yeah. bucks. Yeah. Wow, yeah. half a billion in sales. <laughs> yeah, but that's because of connecting in a way that allowed the customer to be the marketer. It allowed the customer to be the hero. And the I think, storyteller. Yeah, exactly. The champion. And so that's what I think is so unique. Um, and then frankly, you know, we got to half a billion in six years, and then over the last six years, we haven't grown hardly because right. it's been hard to have that fresh story. It's been hard mm -hmm. to have a, a, a reason for someone to get as engaged. Now, people love our shoes, and we still, you know, sell a ton of shoes every year, and the business has been real successful, and we've helped, you know, millions of kids every year get new shoes. So our mission has stayed great, but we haven't had that, like, astronomical growth again because so many people have emulated it yeah. that it's like okay I like your shoes but I'm not I have no need to go on to Twitter or Facebook or you know snapchat or whatever and tell all my friends I bought a pair of shoes mm -hmm. it would actually be weird like it'd be weird if you were like guess what I got Tom shoes today right. and they helped give a pair to a child in need all your your followers would be like yeah like I know that story <laughs> 12 years ago yeah yeah right so unfortunately our Huh. Success and the number of kids that we've helped around the world, while it's been incredibly gratifying, um, it, it, it hasn't until recently had like another big story to tell. And so, so that's what's been, it, it, you know, like any business, you have to kind of, and then you become more focused on mm. the fashion trends and getting the styles right. And we built a great men's business over the last couple of years, but that doesn't happen overnight. Rule number two, empower your customers. People are constantly trying to do the same, make their product 10% better than the other one, or they price yeah. it different. And there's yeah. this huge lane that's open that almost nobody explores, which is do good with your business. Sure. Have a cause link to it. So forgetting the fact that you should do it because it's what a human being should do, just from a business perspective, uh, you are yeah. out of your mind not to be looked at as a cause business to get raving fans who root for your company. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, I think the thing is, is it's actually 
um, two, two important distinctions there. It's not just doing good as a business, but actually transferring the power to your customers to get to do good. Because the, the customer really wants to do good, but oftentimes they're financially constrained, they're time constrained. So if you make it easy for them to experience the, you know, you know, the, the oxytocin high of doing good in the world through a purchase of your product, they will be loyal fans forever. You know, one of my most favorite experiences in the 13 year Tom's journey happened about six months in. It was right after I think the Vogue article came out. I was in New York trying to sell shoes, not doing a very good job of it, mind you. And I went to fly back to LA a little bit with my, you know, tail between my legs. And I had just gone for a run in Central Park and I was rushing to the airport and I did not have Toms on, which was very unique because I always wear Toms, especially in the early days. And I get to the American Airlines check-in counter and I'm getting ready to do the electronic kiosk to get my boarding pass. And I look over and there's a girl like mid thirties standing there wearing a red pair of Toms. Now this was super exciting because this is the very first time I saw a stranger wearing our shoes. It wasn't an intern. It wasn't my parents. It wasn't my neighbor. It was a stranger, you know, 4,000 miles from my home. So I had to ask her about him, but I didn't want to let her know who I was. So I just said, I said, Kaja, I said, hey, excuse me. I could help in noticing these, these red shoes you're wearing. You know, they're so cool. What are they? And she looked at me and her eyes kind of widened. And she said, Tom's, they're Tom shoes. And I'm playing it cool, right? So I keep doing the kiosk. And she wants more of my attention. So she literally, this is a stranger now in the airport, puts her hand on my shoulder, kind of pulls me away from the kiosk. goes, no, you don't understand. This is the most amazing company in the world. When I bought this pair of shoes, they gave a pair to a child in Argentina. And this guy who started, I think he lives on a boat in Los Angeles. And I mean, she started telling my life story word for word with like more passion than my mom tells it. And so at that point, I was like, oh, I have to tell her who I am. Right. <laughs> so she's like just going on and on like a crowd gathering. And so I say, um, excuse me, actually, I, I need to confess something. Um, I'm actually Blake. I started Tom's. And she looks at me like deer in the headlights. Right. And then she goes why did you cut your hair? Because <laughs> she had watched all these YouTube videos of me giving out the shoes in Argentina. I had this long, crazy, curly yeah. hair. But that summer, I had cut it. And that was her one question. But I learned one of the most important business lessons of my life in that exchange. And that is, if you do good, if you really empower your customers to feel like they're part of something, they will do the marketing for you. And that's way more cost effective than any paid advertising you can do. And I think that's why Tom's grew so fast and we made so much money. Rule number three, think differently. There's this great, there's this, this uh, I forget uh, who he was, but this you know famous king and he wanted um, to uh, only walk, he wanted his feet to only touch the most softest leather whenever they, wherever he walked. And all of his people, they were thinking about spending basically all the fortune of the kingdom and, and, and not spreading any of the wealth to the people who need it the most and like hoarding all the wealth so they could pave all the streets in leather. And, and I forget who recommended this, but instead just with like absolute, you know, perfect clarity said, instead, why don't we just strap two pieces of leather to your feet <laughs> and you will always walk in leather. Right. <laughs> and so that's, I think the quote is, you know, from the Buddha or from, you know, I forget, but it's, it's, it's such a great point is that, you know, just by thinking things a little bit differently, um, you can, you can totally change your perspective. Rule number four, take action. Many ideas that people have are never actually acted on. When you first came up with the idea for Tom's, was this a, a, a big serendipitous moment for you? What was it like? You know, it's, it's funny. I, I get that question a lot. And, you know, people say, did, you, did your life change when you thought of Tom's, or when you had the idea? And as kind of romantic or noble as it would be to say yes, the truth is no. You know, it was just an idea. I mean, I was running my other business at the time, and I had this idea, if I sell a pair of shoes, I can give a pair away, and, and, and it was just an idea. But when it became much more than an idea, and when my life really did change, was when I went on that first shoe drop. You know, I took my parents, who had never left the United States before, I took my brother and sister, I took, you know, my intern, Jonathan, 
some of my friends, and we went down there, 16 people who really didn't know each other very well, and we just got on our hands and knees and started putting shoes on kids' feet. And we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, you know, we, we had the shoes made and we knew where the areas that kids needed them. But it was an unbelievable experience to see that just six months before that, it was just an idea. Mm. And this idea had, had got, it got the attention of enough people to buy 10,000 pairs of shoes so that they, we were allowed to go there and give them away. And I'll never forget this one moment because it really was uh, life-changing for me. We were leaving a village and I was walking away and this woman came up and she was crying and she was running after me and she was speaking in Spanish and my Spanish isn't very good. So I went and got my partner, Alejo, and he's Argentine. I said, Alejo, ask her this woman what's wrong. And she had these three boys with her and they all had brand new Tom shoes on. And he said, you know, in Spanish to her. And when she responded, she started to smile. And he was smiling as he was listening to her. So before he even told me the translation, I knew she wasn't crying because she was sad. She was crying because she was happy. But what, what she told Alejo and what he told me just blew me away. She explained that her three sons had been sharing a single pair of shoes for the past year. And what that meant was her oldest son would go to school on Monday, he would come home, give his shoes to his brother, and have to wait until Thursday to go to school again. Wow. I mean, can you imagine? Like, I don't have kids, but I'm sure a lot of people in this room do. I mean, can you imagine if that was the case with your family, that your children had to wait a couple days to go to school because of a pair of shoes? And I had no idea, even when we started, Tom, that it was that much needed. But when that lady told Alejo and he told me and we got very emotional and started crying, and, mm -hmm. I mean, it was like this really amazing moment. But that's when I knew that like, this is what I wanted to do with my life. Also, if you want to have unstoppable confidence, self-love and motivation, check out my 254 series. They're free. The links to join are in the description below. It's so unfortunate because I think doubt is one of the greatest enemies of our lives. And it's so easy to overcome, but most people won't practice the discipline of overcoming it. I've been at a point in my life where I thought, I thought less of me than anyone thought of me. How many have been there? The goal isn't to be the best every day. The goal isn't to, out, to outdo your competition every day. Rule number five, connect wants and needs. Everyone is kind of doing this, you buy one and we give one model, yeah. right? Yeah. What was your original inspiration for, for doing that? And did you think it would actually last 12 years and grow, or was it like, maybe we'll make it past a few years and then give, yeah, away, give away I mean, a bunch of shoes? It, I mean, literally, we, we was, it wasn't even a business when we launched it. We called it a, the Thomas Project. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, um, and what's so interesting is that there's been so many people that have emulated this one for one model, but we didn't really think about like we were creating a model. We just wanted to keep track of it. Like it's the easiest way to keep track of this because you know I was traveling in South America, specifically Argentina. Um, I saw all these kids in the streets, you know, street kids, you know, kind of sniffing glue and kind mm -hmm. of you know really going through tough times, and none of them had shoes on. And I asked this woman um, one day, I was like, you know, why are these kids not in school? And she said, well, one of the reasons they're not in school is they have to have a school uniform to go to school. And part of that uniform is a pair of shoes, a black mm. pair of shoes, actually, and they can't afford it. And so if their wow. families can't afford the uniform and the shoes, then that... They don't go to school. They go to school, and then they get education, into, then they they get into all kinds of bad stuff. And yeah. so, um, you know, when I think back to that moment, you know, the idea I had was so simple. Like I basically went and volunteered with this organization for the day who had gone and gotten donated shoes. Mm -hmm. So they went to wealthy families in Buenos Aires, collected these like slightly used, they weren't even new shoes, but mm -hmm. used shoes. They took them to the kids before the school year and that was their donation. And I went and volunteered and donated shoes and got the joy of seeing kids get shoes. And that night I came home and I was talking to my buddy um, who was a polo teacher of all, mm -hmm. all things. His name's Alejo. And I said, Alejo, I said, this is what I did today. It was amazing. Like, I I felt so good, like I felt like so full of spirit, you mm -hmm. know? And he said, yeah, but what's gonna happen when they need their next pair of shoes? Mm. And it was like, I went from like a 10 to like a five. <laughs> yeah. He was like, oh, like, I don't know. And like, maybe we didn't actually do something good today. Maybe we just like prolonged a future mm -hmm. problem. And that's when I had the idea is like, you know, I've, I've never been in charity, I've never been in philanthropy, but I'm an entrepreneur, I've started a few businesses, and what if you could start a business where every time you sold a pair of shoes, you would give a pair away? And then that way, it's really easy for the customer to understand, it's really easy to keep track of, it's not like, oh, 5% or 10% or 30% of mm -hmm. your sales go to this nonprofit, and then how much it actually gets to the kids. It was like, okay, like you buy a pair, we give a pair. That simple, we'll call it one for one. 
And that was it. And it was just like, you know, I mean, at the time, I mean, I was kind of running another company, an mm -hmm. online education company that I started. This was like a side project. Right. We didn't have like a business plan. We didn't even have a checking account. Like it was like, oh, let's just do this. And truthfully, at the, at the time, I mean, I was single guy, like 29 years old, loved Argentina, yeah. loved going down there. I love Argentina. Right? And so, so I thought fun. like, okay, this is cool. Once a year, right before school, I'll go down there, I'll give a couple hundred kids shoes, and then I'll come back at Christmas, give them all shoes, make it sustainable, yeah. and it would be like my cool little project. Like that was the idea. Yeah, yeah. And now we've given 88 million children a pair wow, of shoes. Wow, man. That's so amazing. 88 million. And, and it's... It's been amazing, and, and I think you know the fact wow. that there's been so many other companies take this one for one and actually call it a model now and, and emulate it has been one of the things that I think I and people at Tom's are most proud of. Like it's amazing that when we read about companies that are helping people with eyeglasses, like yeah. what Warby Parker's yeah. done, or you look at other companies that have done it in everything from diapers to you know mattresses. I mean, it's like there's actually a really interesting way of offering a product to someone that they want to buy and at the same time help someone who has a need that would never be able to afford it. And so that's, I think, one of the things we're most proud of is that it has permeated business culture yeah. around the globe. How many of these one-for-one -one models are out there oh, there's now? there's hundreds, business? if really? not thousands, yeah. I mean, and I go to Korea and they're they're like there and and it just, I guess it just went, it just made sense to people. Like it was like, okay, there's a lot of people that, that want something and there's a lot of people that need something, and you connect the want and the need through commerce, mm -hmm. you can actually, um, you can make it work. Rule number six, have discipline. I was a, a very driven, competitive tennis player growing up. Yeah, I started playing at age 10. By age 15, I was one of the best players in the state and the country. I lived at a tennis academy. I moved away from my family to train, so I would only go to school for part-time during the day. I went to college on tennis scholarship. And then my sophomore year, I had a really bad injury to my Achilles tendon, and I was in crutches and a full leg cast. And that is when I actually had my first entrepreneurial idea. The funny thing is, I didn't even know what the word entrepreneur meant. My dad was a doctor. My grandfather's a doctor. There were no entrepreneurs you know, at that time really in my family, but um, I couldn't carry my laundry down to the facility because of the crutches. And so I looked in the yellow pages, which some listeners won't know what that is. Okay. Um, but uh, I looked in the yellow pages, the early Google, and uh, there was no one that would pick up and deliver my laundry. And so my roommate, his dad was an entrepreneur and we were telling him about this problem. He said, you guys should start a laundry business. And so next thing you know, we bought like an old FedEx truck for 1500 bucks set up shop, started doing people's laundry. I never went back to playing tennis and uh, dropped out of college. And, and that was the beginning of my entrepreneur path. But so much of what I think has made me a successful entrepreneur is that self-reliance because tennis is an individual sport. You don't have a team to count on. The self-discipline that I had to be training so hard at such a young age, the sacrifices I made, you know, I wasn't out drinking beer with people on Friday night because I had matches Saturday morning. So I really, I love to hire athletes for that reason, you know? I love to hire athletes and I love to hire military. Me too. Because they're unbelievable in terms of their discipline and their focus. Um, and that was who I was before becoming an entrepreneur. Rule number seven, recognize what you love doing. What is that ability in that you have that quote makes you a good entrepreneur, not necessarily in carrying it out, but in recognizing the um, opportunity yeah. there? Because anyway, the, the, the background is, I get a lot of questions from people, how do I get your job? Yeah, sure. And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. It would kind of be like saying someone, how did, how, sure. how do I get your job? It's like, yeah. well, I don't know. I just saw a problem. Yeah. So I bet you, I, it'd be interesting to see if you would reckon, you would um, say the same thing if you, if you thought about how you created your job and how I created mine. I always say that like, it's recognizing like a small thing that you love or want to do and just kind of doing it and not worrying about, is this a business? Is this a company? Is this going to work? Like, I mean, when I met those kids in Argentina, like, my initial goal was to put 200 shoes on kids' feet. And like, and I wasn't sure, and I, I didn't even open up a bank account because I didn't think it was a business. I thought it was, you know, this is something fun I'm gonna do as a project. We call it the Tom's Project originally, not even Tom's business. I like that. And so- That could be the elite sort of line <laughs> yeah. now. Wait, so you didn't, you didn't 
I didn't. Set you didn't, out you didn't run this. home and be like, no. "I got a million dollar idea." No, 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 no. no. I had another. That's, I hear that a lot nowadays. Yeah, I yeah. got a million dollar idea. See, I think that's the differences, and probably you know when you had your first idea to you know make a video about you know traveling around the world, playing golf in interesting places, or meeting interesting people. It was probably your curiosity and like, "Hey, this will be fun. Like, maybe I'll make some money." But what I really am going to do is I'm about an awesome time. Yeah, yeah. You know, at least that's what I get by watching yeah. watching you. Oh, exactly. So, 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 just the same thing. I was like, okay, if I can sell 200 pairs of shoes, come back at Christmas. How fun is it going to be to give all these kids a pair of shoes? And plus, I loved Argentina. I mean, I was single. I was with beautiful women there. Right. I was having a lot of fun. Like, you know, I was learning to play polo. All these things. So it was like this was like an idea that was going to a be very gratifying and helping these kids get shoes. It was going to be a lot of fun and it just turned out to be an incredible business. Right. So I think that what I tell people all the time is like, if you set out to create a business idea to make a lot of money, almost 90% of the time that fails. No one chooses to be an entrepreneur. They become an entrepreneur. And they become an entrepreneur because they see a problem in the world that they want to fix. Maxi's, all these amateurs burdened by swing thoughts, not able to get all the best instruction, training, et cetera, in one place. So he has a passion to help, you know, amateur golfers. It turns into a business UGP. You know, you had a passion to travel, tell golfer stories. It turns into a business that you have today. Same with Tom's. And so I say, like, like if you look at the great companies in the world, all the big brands, I mean, whether it's Starbucks or it's or it's Apple or it's whatever, like, you know, Steve Jobs wasn't like trying to come up with a business idea. He was like fascinated with how computers could change people's lives. You know, St Howard Schultz was in Italy and he's like, why don't we have <laughs> this beautiful espresso experience? We're drinking Folgers. I mean, yeah. you know, so I'm sorry with all the cussing. I no, I had a Starbucks this morning. <laughs> okay. and I I loved it. <laughs> I don't know my audience. Um, so anyways, but, but that's, I think that's like, literally I speak so many places. It's such a joy for me to share my experience with others because so many people have helped me. But that's the one piece of advice I'm so consistent on is like, if you, if you look at entrepreneurs and say, that's the lifestyle I want, that's what I want to do. I say, stop thinking about being an entrepreneur and start thinking about what do you want to change in the world? What's not working? And it could be my coffee machine's not working or, you know, I want to have a, a better fitting pair of jeans. I mean, who it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a lofty goal like I want to help children from suffering, but th that's how you become an entrepreneur. That's how you actually create the dream job. Rule number eight, help others. So a big part of what's inspired me the past four years has not just been like, kind of being the spiritual guide of Tom's, but really helping other non, you know, nonprofits get started, yeah. other social entrepreneurs get started, and really seeing them thrive. Wow. Like, there's this great organization I always love talking about because it's one of my very first investments called Art Lifting. And it was this really smart uh, young entrepreneur from Boston, um, and when she was going to school every day as an undergrad, she would see homeless people on the street um, but they would be trying to sell artwork that they could create. And she was like, this, if you took this art and you put it in a gallery and it wasn't had the stigma of someone who's homeless, mm -hmm. you would pay a lot of money for this right. art. So she created the first art gallery for profit to represent, you know, homeless artists. Wow. And she's taken, and she now expanded all over the world. And so now you have all these amazingly talented people who unfortunately have had some negative events in their life that ended up getting them on uh -huh. the streets. Now they're not only selling original pieces in galleries, but then they're licensing them to like hotel groups like Hilton, there's Billabong, you know, board shorts are buying, you know. so. That's a perfect example That's of what's cool. inspired me is it's called art lifting is is finding people who are like, okay, I see a problem in the world. I have a entrepreneurial for profit mm -hmm. solution and putting them together and then usually they need some capital and a little bit of mentorship and that's yeah. where me and my wife have spent a lot of time. Wow, how so, many people have you uh, invested with? Uh, I think with we've in invested in like 30 or 40 of these companies now. Um, and, 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 and you know, not all of them have worked out, but a lot of them are, are actually thriving businesses now. Mm. Rule number nine, hydrate properly. Hydration is one of these amazing things that I think we all think we drink enough water, but we really don't understand like what is the right amount of water for us. And there's a lot of myths out there that we have to debunk. And we spend a lot of time during this month talking about those. But really, 70% of our body is water, um, which I think is also a beautiful connection that 70% of our planet is water. There's no coincidence there. Um, and, and, and really what people have always been worried about or tried to prevent is this word dehydration. 
But the problem is, is by the time that you're dehydrated, you're really kind of fucked. Like, I mean, people worry about this like massive loss in water, but even a 1%, the science shows a 1% decline in your optimal hydration will affect your mood. It'll affect your energy level. It'll affect um, how your internal organs are working and definitely it'll affect your sleep. So hydration is like the most important fundamental thing for you to have the best opportunity to physically feel your best every day. Now, not everyone should drink the same amount of water. And this is where we get into trouble because we've heard eight glasses of water or this yeah. amount of water. But it's really, and this is what we help you with Made For, find out the exact recipe for you. And that is based on, you know, your body weight, based on what climate you live in, based on how much physical activity, even your diet. So if you're on a uh, mainly plant-based diet, you're getting so much water that's stored in those plants versus if you're on a more meat diet, there's not as much water stay. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is keep hustling. Blake, you came to South by Southwest seven years ago when you started. What are the biggest changes in your experience this year from that first year? <laughs> so the first year I came to South by Southwest, I was living in an Airstream trailer selling the shoes out of the back of the trailer on 2nd Street and like fighting off the cops trying to get us to move it. Um, so it was a very different experience uh, now. Um, but I think the thing is it was actually exciting because I'd been back to South by Southwest a couple times in between is when I was flying in on a plane, I was thinking about like, I had the same kind of hope and hustle right now that I did seven years ago because of getting in a totally new business. You know, one of the great things uh, about, you know, my job is that we get to continue to innovate and have new ideas. And even though, you know, Tom's as a brand has grown and we have a lot of different processes and systems and all these things you have to do as a, as a larger business, we still get to, you know, take risk and be entrepreneurial. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what was your single biggest takeaway from this video? And write down in the comments below when you're going to take action on that takeaway this week. When you schedule in what day, what time, and what place you're gonna take action, you have a 91% chance of actually following through, compared to just 35% if you just got motivated but never created a plan. And when you share your plan and have accountability, you give yourself an even higher chance of following through. So in the comments below, write down your single biggest takeaway as well as your specific plan of action, because I want to celebrate with you. As you look at the last four years, there's been a meteoric rise. This success has been really incredible. And uh, I think you would have to attribute it to a lot of strategic partnerships that you've had. You've done some things with Ralph Lauren and Microsoft and AT&T. What have you learned about the importance of strategic partnerships? You know, we've been incredibly blessed. I mean, there's no way that we would be able to give away the number of shoes we have without not only the partnerships like you just listed with the corporate partners, but with, you know, all the many churches that have helped us. So first off, I just want to say thank you. If you're in the audience and you support us, thank you very much because it's, um, it's been amazing. I mean, with one day without shoes, and just, you know, people, um, it's, it's really been, we've had such unbelievable support from the beginning. Um, you know, but the corporate partnerships are a little different than churches. Like, you, you know, churches kind of make sense. The corporate partnerships, AT&T, you know, what would they want with Tom's? Um, but I think what, what the reason why the AT&T thing worked is we gave them um, an authentic story. You know, I'm never in the office. I use my BlackBerry or iPhone nonstop, you know, when I'm traveling all over the world. I mean, I might be speaking at a university in Ohio or in Ethiopia doing a shoe drop, but I'm very rarely in the office. And so for me to help run this business, I have to stay connected. And someone from AT&T, a very smart person, realized that that was a great story because that is how their technology really was helping the world and helping more kids get shoes. And so when they contacted us, I immediately said yes, because it was so authentic. And I think that's why it resonated with people so much, is it was authentic. So we gave them kind of an authentic testimony, if you will, of how their technology was helping kids get shoes. And in return, we got incredible reach. I mean, how many people here, I'm just curious, saw the AT&T commercial, raise your hand. I mean, it's like 75% of the people, you know? And, and, that's, and, that's, and we didn't pay a penny for that. So yeah. it's unbelievable. So the strategic partnership's been a huge part of how we've grown. And, we, everyone at Tom's is, is incredibly thankful.
If you want to change your life for free in the next 30 days, check the link below me. Or if you want to learn 10 rules from Bill Gates, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy them. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.